mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and things which are despised has God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. And it says basically in verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence. And so here we see that the Bible is very clear that um, the ways and means that he uses is not as the world would use. And uh, he says that it's, it's completely different to, to the way that the world would handle things. Uh, we see that in Isaiah chapter 55, we don't have to turn there. It speaks about how God says that my ways are not your ways, you know, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. As far as the heavens are above, so are my ways, and obviously his thoughts far away above our ways and our thoughts. And here he's maybe confirming it, and he says that, you know, the things that are really um, despised um, in this world, God uses those things, the foolish things to confound the wise and the things, uh, the base things that are not considered, he uses those things, um, uh, obviously to reveal his glory and uh, so forth. And we see that um, uh, we fit basically in that category. Um, and uh, we see that how the Lord has, has used us and has displayed that within the scriptures that we're going to look at uh, maybe now. If we maybe turn to uh, the book of First um, Samuel in chapter 17. Um, that is a typical description that the Bible gives how he has re revealed through simplic simplicity his divine power. Um, First Samuel in chapter 17, we obviously know the story very well with uh, David and Goliath. I can just get there. Just bear with me. And so we see a situation here that uh, where Israel was basically challenged by the, the Philistines and uh, we see that they were at war with the Philistines. And uh, we see that uh, we know the story is that uh, Goliath uh, came out day by day to challenge um, uh, Israel. And uh, we see that uh, the challenge was that, uh, you know, if um, they defeat him, then uh, um, the Philistines will will um, serve them. But if it's uh, differently, then Israel must serve the Philistines. And so we see that uh, here's a challenge, a giant of a challenge that uh, was uh, confronted uh, by Israel and uh, something that uh, um, seemed that it was impossible to overcome. And uh, we see that it, it went like that for some time um, until the challenge was met uh, by David, you know, and uh, it's uh, uh, unintentionally, um, he basically stumbled across this problem, um, but he took up the challenge to, to, to destroy uh, this massive um, Philistine, this giant. And uh, maybe we pick it up in um, verse uh, 32. First Samuel in chapter 17 in verse 32. Um, it says in, uh, and David said to Saul, uh, let no man's heart fail because of him. Uh, thy servant shall go and fight with this Philistine. And so we see that this uh, youngster, this uh, teenager, um, said that he will take up this challenge. And this wasn't a vain challenge um, that he presented. Um, this challenge had uh, substance within it. And uh, Saul couldn't understand how, how, how this youngster um, that have got no military experience, you know, are prepared to, to go against um, this massive giant, this massive problem. And it says in verse 33, And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but the youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And it says uh, further, it says, And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and uh, took a lamb out of uh, the flock. 
and I went after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. And uh, so we see that uh, David gave a bit of his testimony of obviously what the Lord has performed in his life. And uh, we see that um, it's a situation where, where David was, so to say, on fire in the Lord. And we see that Saul and the children of Israel was pretty cold where the things of the Lord were concerned. And that's why they couldn't take, you know, this challenge up with this massive problem that confronted them. And uh, we see straight away the difference here. It says, first, um, uh, in 36 further, it says, and says this, the servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing as the, he has defied the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out, out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. And so we see that he built up his confidence through the testimony of the Lord that was performed in him. And uh, straight away see that, uh, we see that, uh, that's, that David was basically on par with the things of the Lord. Um, this uh, didn't come as maybe a surprise to him or uh, it didn't come in such a way that he, he feared because he knew that... Uh, he was on par with the things of the Lord. Um, he drew, drew strength and confidence out of the testimony of the Lord that was performed in his life. And uh, we see that uh, he was in line, so to say, as we'd say, with the things of the Lord. He walked in, in our term. He walked in the spirit. And uh, so we see that uh, he had this confidence. Um, it says further, and... Uh, Saul armed David with his armor and he put a helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail, and that is in verse 38. And David girded his sword upon his armor and he said to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. And so once again, that we can see this as maybe this armor that uh, was given unto him. He said, I'm not familiar with this. You know, I have not proved it. I'm not accustomed to these things. And it's basically a type of the world and the things of the world and the strength of this world and the wisdom of this world and all that pertaineth to this world. And uh, Saul basically wanted to clothe him with the things of this world to overcome this giant. And he said, I do not know these things. And uh, we can see that uh, as a type, um, the, the whole army of Israel was Saul who had to be, so to say, a forerunner. Didn't set a good example. I said that they were completely, you know, out of sorts where the things of the Lord were concerned. They were entrenched with the things of this world and the, the ways and the means and the strategies of this world, there were no trust or believe in God. All that they could rely upon, it was the flesh. The wisdom of the world, the strength of this world, yeah, even the armor of this world. And there was nothing of God other than David. You know, his reliance was upon the word of God. And so basically what he's saying is that do not give me things that I'm not accustomed to. I am not accustomed to the things of this world. I do not seek the counsel of this world. I do not seek the wisdom of this world. I do not do things according to the strength of this world, you know, because I'm only accustomed to the things of God. And in his testimony, he basically says that, you know, this is my testimony. This is how the Lord has delivered me. This is what I'm walking in. And this is what I am relying upon. And uh, so we see that uh, uh, the, the differentiation between uh, these two parties was so far apart, you know, and uh, they were so cold to the things of the Lord, you know, that they couldn't see the victory other than David, who were on par with the things of the Lord. 
you know, and he could see, you know, he had a clear vision and understanding of how the Lord will deliver him. But um, we see further in the story, um, it says in verse 40, and he took his staff in his hand and uh, chose him five uh, smooth stones out of the brook and uh, put them in the shepherd's bag, which he had even in the script. And his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David and the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about, he saw David, he disdained him for he was uh, but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. And uh, um, it basically, uh, so to say, um, insulted his, his uh, stature, he, so to say, his, his intelligence, so to say, because he was but a ruddy boy, you know, and um, he couldn't be compared to, to, to obviously, his stature. And uh, so he was insulted by the fact that uh, Israel sent this youngster to come and fight uh, with him, once again thinking as the world thinks. And it says, And the Philistine said unto David, Am uh, I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine pierced David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, I will give um, thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. And then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. So you come to me with the things of this world. But he said, But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. And so straight away he says that, you know, I do not come to you with the things of this world, you know, and uh, st strategically um, with the things of this world, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, of the God of the armies of Israel. And so his strength was in the Lord. His reliance was obviously in the Lord. In verse 46, it says that this day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand. And I will smite and take thine head from thee. I will give thy carcasses of the host of uh, Philistines this day to the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Wonderful. That they, all the earth may know the testimony of the Lord performed, obviously, on that day. And it says, And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword, obviously, with the world and the things of this world the wisdom and the strength and the power of this world. For the battle is the Lord, and he will give you into our hands. And it came to pass when the Philistine came and drew nigh to meet David. And David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in the ba his bag and took the stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead. And the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face, face to the earth. And so we see that an amazing victory that the Lord has given unto David. And once again, as I said, the title of my talk, through simplistic methods, you know, God has revealed his divine power. A situation that seemed absolutely impossible to overcome. And as I said, that this has continued for some time where the, the, they, the, in this valley that was between the two mountains where the, the opposing uh, tribe stood, stood. Day by day, he would come and he would uh, defile the army of the living God. He would defile God, you know, and he would challenge. And nobody took up the challenge. And so we see that here, a man of God, who was on par with the things of the Lord, whose reliance was upon God and nobody else, who stood on the testimony of the Lord that the Lord has performed in his life, we see that God, through simplistic methods, has de revealed his divine power in this situation. And as I said, this is just one situation how the Lord has displayed, you know, his uh, divinity revealed through simplicity. Now the story is in Second Kings in chapter 5, if we just turn there. Second Kings in chapter 5. Here's a situation where um, the um, Assyrians um, 
was uh, sort of as the Philistines were dominant force in the days of Saul. And so we see that here in this point in time, you see that the Syrians is a dominated force in obviously their territory and also where the children of Israel are concerned. And it says here that uh, in verse 1 of 2 Kings and in chapter 5 it says, And now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper, the Bible says. And so we see that we know that a leper is somebody who had leprosy. And uh, we see that uh, the Bible gives us the indication that leprosy is basically a type of sin. First of all, that it is highly contagious. You know, uh, it infects you if you should rub, rub shoulders with somebody or touch that person, then you will also become a leper. Um, so it was highly contagious as, as sin was, you know, because of Adam and Eve. We see that it has infected the whole of mankind. And so we see that uh, just a sin uh, can uh, be cured only but by the power of God. Even so, is leprosy that can only be cured by, by the power of God. And uh, secondly, uh, that it basically um, isolated the person, you know, um, outside the camp of Israel or wherever that person uh, found himself, that he would be put outside of the camp and he will dwell alone or he would uh, dwell with lepers. And so we see that there was isolation. Even so, we were isolated or separated from God because of sin. And so we see that uh, um, leprosy is basically, um, as maybe we all well know, is a type of sin. And this guy was physically a leper and he desired to be cleansed. He desired to get rid of this leprosy. And it says in verse 2, And the Syrians had gone out by the companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. And so this little maid was taken captive by the Syrians, and uh, she actually waited on Naaman's wife. She was a servant to Naaman's wife. And it says, And she said unto her mistress, Who to God, my Lord, were with a prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And so we see that uh, she probably saw that it was uh, pretty much of a concern in uh, the domestic life of Naaman. And obviously the wife must have talked about it and, and uh, they must have seen many physicians and went to doctors or whatever to have uh, this leprosy cured. And it was uh, something major to a point where she said, look, there's a prophet in, in Samaria and Israel you know, if only he can get in touch with this prophet, then I'm pretty sure that he can be healed because obviously she knew that they served the true God. And we see that um, the preceding verses uh, um, um, explains how they got in touch with, with uh, the prophet and so forth. And eventually we see that he took a trip uh, to the prophet, uh, Elisha, and uh, obviously seeking to be healed of of this. And it says here that in verse 10, and Elisha sent the messenger unto him, saying, Go wash in Jordan seven times. And once again, that Elisha sent his messenger instead of coming himself. First of all, once again, that is was probably an insult that you know Elisha would send his servant or his slave, you know, to come and convey this message unto Naaman. And it says, uh, wash seven times and thy flesh shall come again to thee and thou shalt be clean. And so we see that that was a simple, simple instruction that was given unto him. Just go into the Jordan, wash thyself seven times and you shall be clean. This that you are desiring to be cleansed of, you know, just go and do it. This that has been pestering you maybe for years or for months, and I don't know for how long, but it was a concern. Just as a simple instruction, go into the, this river Jordan and wash thyself seven times and you shall be cleansed. It says in verse 11, And Naaman was wroth and went away and said, Behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Once again, I thought 
We just mentioned that in Isaiah chapter 55, my thoughts are not your thoughts. And how many times are we not confronted in the world when we preach to them the simple gospel? Just repent, be baptized, and you shall receive the Holy Spirit. You'll speak in other tongues. They would say, I thought this and I thought that. And they do not want to give heed, you know, because they want to do things according to their thoughts according to their traditions, according to the way that they've been taught and so forth, and they never receive it. Same attitude with, with Naaman. I thought this would happen, and I thought that would happen. And he says, even, he speaks about maybe these rivers that is maybe a little bit more superior to the River Jordan. Are not Abana and Barfa, rivers of Damascus, better than all the rivers of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and he went away in a rage. In the same way today, people say, but why can't we do this? Why can't we do that? Isn't all religions the same? Um, don't we serve the same God? No, we don't. If it's not the God of the Bible, you know, then it's not the same God. If it's not according to the scriptures, then it is not the same. And uh, so he, he, he went away in a rage, it says further. And then it was said, and it says, and his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, who didst thou not have done it? How much rather then when he saith unto thee, wash and be clean. And so he says that, you know, if you had to go on a quest to, you know, to do some great thing, to go and conquer a city, you know, or to do some other great thing, would you not have done it? This, this prophet is just saying to you, simply just go and wash. You know, and, uh, and, and you shall be clean. And lo and behold, when some sense was knocked into him, it says in verse 14, then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again, like unto the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. Simplistic, and God revealed his divine power. And so we see that his flesh became as a little child. And straight away we can see maybe this is a type of our salvation. First of all, leprosy, a type of sin. Secondly, the waters of baptism, you know, um, is a type of the fact that he had to dip himself. The fact that he became as a little child, we know that when we are baptized, the old life is washed away and is dead and buried in the baptism tank. And uh, miraculously, we, we are raised up as a new person, as a newborn child, receive the Holy Spirit, speak in other tongues. And it's basically a type of what we have received. And as I said, the point is, once again, so through some simplistic ways, God once again has displayed his divine power in this story once again. And uh, we can speak about a lot of things and uh, how uh, God has revealed it and types and things like that and situations. But I think we will just maybe stick to, to these two. Um, if we go to 2 Corinthians and chapter 11. Here yeah, Paul says, it says in verse 1 of chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians, it says, Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly and indeed bear with me. And he says, I'm jealous of you with God in jealousy for I've espoused you to one husband. And it says that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear less by any means, he says, as a serpent beguiled Eve through subtlety, it says, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And so he says that, you know, we should take heed of these things, that we do not fall under the same banner. Naaman almost lost, so to say, his blessing. And, uh, you know, the divine power of God uh, being um, revealed through him. He lost, almost lost that opportunity. 
because his mind was corrupted. Once again, if we go back to Adam and Eve, and especially Eve in the garden, you know, where they received a simple instruction of everything you may eat, but not of that specific tree. A simple, simple instruction. And so we see that the Bible says that the enemy came and obviously took this simple instruction and confused the whole matter. It actually says that he corrupted the mind. He's put all sorts of things in a mind to a point where he even said unto her that you shall be as God. And, and, and we see that she, she, she was tricked and she was, you know, um, um, seduced, so to say, to a point where the Bible says that she went off according to the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. Her mind was corrupted to that extent. And because she couldn't accept the simple instruction or maintain the simple instruction, we see that her mind was corrupted and we see that both of them fell from grace. Paul says, let it not happen to us, you know, that now that we have received this simple instruction and the simplicity of Christ, that our minds also be corrupted as a serpent has beguiled Eve. And so we see that we have received the divine power of God, you know, because we receive it, received it in its simplest, simplest form. If maybe we go to um, if we go to Isaiah chapter 28. Uh, there's lots of other scriptures, but just for the sake of time, Isaiah chapter 28. And uh, maybe we pick it up in verse um, 9. It says here, Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? It says, To whom shall he do that? He says further to them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. And it speaks about babes or newborns that are weaned from the milk and are drawn from the breast. Straight away we think about the born again. Babes born again. And it is to us who are the born again you know, that is teaching knowledge <clears throat> and to make understand doctrine. And that is another talk in a talk. And it says further, it says uh, in verse 11, with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people to whom he said, this is the rest wherewith he may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. And so he says, speaks about babes, obviously, those who are drawn from the breast and the uh, a wind from the milk is obviously babes, as I said, and it says with stammering lips, speaks about our salvation and our experience of receiving the Holy Spirit. To them, he will teach knowledge. To them, he will make to understand. And we know that that is us because the Bible speaks about the fact that our eyes has been enlightened, I think, as it says in Ephesians, to the, know the hope of his calling. We've got this understanding we have received this vision concerning especially his salvation plan in its simplistic form. Repent, be baptized, receive the Holy Spirit. You will speak in other tongues. Nothing complicated about it. Very simple. Let us not try to you know, be persuaded otherwise, irrespective if we are confronted with whatever to confuse the matter. For those who want to theorize it and, you know, philosophize, let us not fall for that. Because we've got the proof, the truth with proof. He has revealed his divine power through simplicity in us. He has revealed divinity when we receive the Holy Spirit. And as that has been initiated within our walks, the Lord will continue to do so. You know, through simplistic methods, he will reveal his divine power. 
Um, maybe to finish off in Psalm 119. Psalm 119. And we pick it up in the verse 130 just to Psalm 119 and in verse 130. And it says here, the entrance of thy words giveth light. And we know the Bible says that he has given his word as a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. So it says, the entrance of thy words giveth light. And it giveth understanding to the simple. And that is us. For we who have embraced the word of God. For we who have followed the instruction of Jesus Christ. We said... You know, if you want to enter the kingdom of God, you must become as a little child. You must become sim simple. And you must listen to the simple instruction that Jesus said. That is what we've done. We have repented from our ways. We have repented from our thoughts. We have repented from our religion and our tradition because we were confronted with the truth, the simplistic truth we have turned away from those things and god has honored his word with evidence when he filled us with the holy spirit and so god will continue to do so as we continue to walk before him as children not that we don't need to grow and even if we do grow our attitude before god is not to become uplifted but to continue as simple children before God and says, when God says it, we do it, and that settles it. No arguments, no philosophies, no theories, you know, no personal you know, wisdom of our own we want to add to the word of God. You know, Paul says in Galatians, he speaks about even if an angel come unto you and says anything different to what the word of God says, obviously. Let him be a curse. Revelation says about adding and subtracting from the word of God. Let us stick to the simple word of God. And as God has maybe displayed that through these examples that we have gone through tonight. And in our own personal capacity, he has revealed his divine power. And we have experienced his divine power when we receive the Holy Spirit. You know through very simple ways and methods and so god shall continue to do so as we maintain you know humbleness simplicity submission to god and to the word of god and maybe that's the encouragement tonight and all the people say amen